passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original system. The English reader may easily translate any word back to the original system. The Our Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. Companion In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines in the okay. Companion Bible. I'll explain what that is in a minute, what Bible. you guys are hearing. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter, and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible now, I'll explain this in a variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Bible. Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. Okay. Did you guys hear that in the background? Yeah, sorry. I mean, I got some weird looking facial expressions. Anyway, you guys heard that in the background? <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. May the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, beatify us. Radiate with the beauty of Jesus Christ for the glory of Jesus Christ. Anyway, uh, we'll, I'll begin in a more intense prayer in a moment. I'll explain what's that in the background in a minute. Guys, I want to show you one of my favorite cartoon memes, Winnie the Pooh. I was meditating on it today uh, because some days are harder than other days for me. And you guys see, I try to be as open as possible without being too open so I don't cause people to stumble or put a weapon in the hands of those who hate me to bash me. But some days are harder than others for me. And today was one of those days. No, that's just because I'm drinking Diet Pepsi. I've been cutting out diet sodas because they're terrible. But some days I drink that just to assuage my sweet tooth, especially because I'm really committed on – trying to lose more weight slowly but surely over time. So that's what you're saying. So that makes it a little hoarse, right? Come on, choose Jesus, man. Sorry about that. Man, I hate my teeth. If they hated Jesus Christ, our God, who's perfect, do you think they're going to love us with our issues? But some days are harder than others. Today was very hard for me. I mean, really hard because, you know, I know I sound like a broken record and, you know, pity party and boo-hoo-hoo. -hoo. Uh, yeah, but it's diet soda, so I try not to drink it too much. But uh, today I was really, really aching for my two angels. I really was. I really, really love those girls, and I miss them. The best gift that Jesus gave me on earth, the best gift that he gave me on earth, meaning... There is no greater gift than knowing Jesus and being in love with Jesus. Honestly, there is no greater gift than knowing Jesus and being in love with Jesus. Because Jesus is life. He is reality. He is God. He is real. And I fail him daily with my struggles. But one thing, the Lord knows my heart better than I do. And in my heart, I'm in love with him. I can't imagine life without him. And I can't imagine him, you know, <clears throat> see, I'm getting emotional thinking about it. If you were to cast me away. But the beautiful thing about Jesus, he says he'll never cast anyone away. That comes to him. When I say, I mean, that comes to him. Right? And uh, after the Lord, the best gifts were my two angels and, you know, my Sarai and Zipporah. Let me just share. And let me let you in my world a little bit. You know, I try to be honest with you guys. And I know... Social media is not the best platform because you have snakes who are going to take your information, spread it to slander you. God will deal with them, right? Growing up, I always ached. This is just a true confession. I share this with you. Growing up, I always ached for my mother to just verbally affirm me. My mother was an amazing woman, an amazing woman. But she was raised old-fashioned Assyrian style where... She really didn't verbalize her love, and she was very tough. Those of you Assyrians, you know what I'm talking about. You know, tough and yell at you and chase you with a, with a pan or a belt, but she gave her life to her six children. She was an amazing woman. But see, growing up, you know, growing up, I've always wanted verbal affirmation. You know how they talk about the love languages, I guess, you know? And I guess... My, my love language 
and I hope my beard doesn't make me old and nasty, but my love language has been verbal affirmation, right? When I talk about verbal affirmation, I'm talking about from my mother. And that wasn't her love language. So that put a very deep void in my heart, right? And so being fallen, this fallen world, a world in which tainted by sin, corrupted by evil, and influenced by Satan, as imperfect fallen creatures, our heart's desire is to be loved and affirmed. And so we look in, look for it in all the wrong places. It's just, it's not a cliche, it's a fact. The last place we turn to is Jesus Christ, right? And so I've always wanted the affirmation, the verbal affirmation of a woman. That was my need, my lack. Man, when the Lord gave me two daughters, in fact, when my ex-wife was pregnant, I was hoping it would be a daughter. I wanted a daughter. Man, when, when my daughters were born, man, I couldn't ask for more beautiful girls than my two girls. And that emptiness was filled by them. <clears throat> they would run up to me and affirm me verbally, right? Sorry, guys. <clears throat> I don't mean to do that, but to hear them say, I love you, Baba. I was in paradise. The world was mine, you know? The world was mine. Because finally, I had two women, two young women who loved me for me and would affirm me. When I had my daughters run into my arms and they would put their chest, their head on my chest and say, I love you, Baba. I was in heaven. <clears throat> I was in heaven, right? So, but anyway, God is good. He's beautiful. Anyway, uh, if you click on that link, if you click on that link, you'll see I was meditating on this. It's Winnie the Pooh, right, holding his little buddy's hand, and he says this. I was just thinking about it. I was at Barnes & Noble's trying to finish an article and preparing myself, and it says, if there ever comes a day when we can't be together, keep me in your heart. I'll stay there forever. Keep me in your heart. I'll stay there forever. Right? You see why Jesus Christ says, you see why Jesus Christ says that you must enter the kingdom as a child. You, you with children understand what it's like. A child can throw a tantrum one minute, but then the next minute they're running into your arms and they're running to hold you and hug you and hold your hand tight because they have absolute assurance and no doubt you love them and you'll protect them. And that's what Jesus wants from us. You know that, right? You understand why the Lord Jesus in Matthew 18, verses 1 to 14, and Matthew 19, verses 13 to 15, right? Talks about entering the kingdom as a child and the kingdom of God belonging to children. Because pay attention to a child. They may get angry with you, throw a tantrum. Next minute, they're running into your arms, hugging you. And they never question your loyalty and never question that you're there to protect them and love them, right? And whenever they're hurt, they run to you. Whenever they want some, they run to you. That's what Jesus wants. Childlike trust, childlike faith, childlike innocence, childlike love from us, right? That's what he wants. So with that said, click on that and see that picture of Winnie the Pooh and it touches my heart. And then a young man, a brother in the Lord, I won't mention his name. When I posted on Facebook, he said he was going through the album that his mother made for him and his brother. His mother has passed and has entered her rest. She goes, he said that she posted that in that album, right? The mother put that. It's hard not to cry, right? It's hard not to cry, but anyway. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Father, I say on behalf of everyone here, and I know they amen this from their heart. We are in love with you, Father. We're in love with you, Abba. We're in love with you, Lord Jesus. We're in love with you, Lord Jesus. We're in love with you, Holy Spirit, because you are love, and you're in love with us, in love with us. You are God. You are real. 
Without you, we couldn't exist. Have mercy on us, Father. Have mercy on these broken vessels. Have mercy on us for our weaknesses, our imperfections, our sins, our impatience, our anger, how we mistreat one another, and I'm guilty of that, Father. For the sake of Jesus, forgive us and wash us in the blood of Jesus and transform us by your spirit and help us to love you more than we love the world and our desires. And Father, use this session. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Anoint my mouth to speak truth without error and to recall the passages correctly. And sanctify my motives, not to put on a show, Father, not to try to endear myself to people and save me from being unnecessarily offensive, but to do it for the glory of Jesus Christ. May he increase in us, Father. May we decrease. Bless the session, Father. Fill everyone with wisdom and knowledge and understanding and insight from your spirit. And by your spirit, create a love in our hearts to passionately be in love with you and with, with your son, the Lord Jesus, and passionate love with your spirit, Father. Protect us from the enemy. Protect us from the world. Protect us from our own flesh and make us stronger in our love for you and our bond with one another, Father. For the glory of Jesus to become more like Jesus in holiness and righteousness and love and mercy and compassion. And fill us with the Spirit, Father. And Father, be with those who are heartbroken. Be with our family members who can't be with us. In my case, be with my two angels, Abba. Love them as only you can love them. And fill them with joy and peace and love. And fill them with your Spirit. And wash them in the blood of Jesus. And bring them to me sooner than later, Father. Bless this time, Father. Be glorified in and through us. You don't need us. You don't need me. We need you. And help me to be a blessing to your church, not a curse. And save us from the children of the devil coming to distract us, Father, please. We need you, Abba. We need you, Lord Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, Son, Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. All right. You see, the title is a little different today because I watched, yesterday I watched, it wasn't a professional version, professional recording. Some Unitarian heretics who claim to be Christian. That does the noose good. Oh, I like that. I like the word you use. Noose or nous? Noose. Right. <laughs> uh, I was watching the unprofessional version of James White's debate with Shabir Ali in Atlanta yesterday because – James White noted that most of the people there, well, I shouldn't say most, but there were a lot of Unitarian heretics there, meaning those who claim to be Christian, who shamelessly butcher the scriptures and blaspheme Jesus by saying that Jesus is simply a human creature. In fact, the granddaddy of these heretics was there, Sir Anthony Buzzard. He was there in the debate. And the debate was Trinity versus Tawheed. I listened to it, and... James White did an amazing job, and that's one thing I want to share. I felt led to say this, and I pray God will help me to overcome my flesh and that my anger won't get the best of me. You guys have known that for a couple of years I've gone after James White. I've said some things. In fact, shamefully, I've even said some harsh things about the brother, and I've been angry with him primarily because – I know of many Christian brothers and sisters who've been hurt and offended and angry by the way James White approaches them or deals with them when he is criticizing their views on his dividing line, right? And so because I've seen the pain and hurt, I've gotten angry with him and I've gone after him social media and said things quite harshly. I have to say, may God forgive me for that. But let me let me be upfront with you, okay? Can I just take this one moment and be upfront with you? Okay, the reason why I was so angry with this brother and I went after him social media, it's not because I hate him. Actually, I love James White deeply. I really love him deeply. The reason why I love him deeply is because early in my Christian walk, he was one of the teachers that God used to mold me and shape me. In fact, I, I've never had anyone take me under their wing and disciple me. So if you ask me, have I ever been mentored spiritually? No. Was there any pastor in my life that took me under his wing and molded me? No. What it was is the sovereign Holy Spirit just working in me and guiding me 
to the to the sources and resources and watching people and reading people's articles and materials and those having an impact on me. Yep, uh, Robert Morey was an influence, but no, he never discipled me, Vine. Uh, I, did he say he did? No, he didn't. He never, never discipled me. I've read Robert Morey's books, watched his videos, and he too. Let me name some people that were used mightily to influence me early on in my Christian walk. Robert Morey was one of them. I used to be in awe of that man. I got to be careful mentioning this gentleman because someone left a comment that I'm going to have to criticize some of his teachings. He too has passed away like Robert Morey. One of the biggest influences on my life early on was, believe it or not, Pastor Arnold Murray of Shepherd's Chapel. Arnold Murray of Shepherd's Chapel. And I'm going to have to deal with some of the issues because I've seen a brother mentioned in a comment section that family members are influenced by his teaching. And some of his teaching is out there and has no scriptural basis for it. But what made him impressive is that he would tell you to get a Strong's Concordance, check up the Hebrew and the Greek of the words that he was <clears throat> expounding on, and he would tell you to get the Companion Bible. And because of him, early on, I got a Strong's Concordance and a Companion Bible. In fact, I have the Companion Bible in my car. I was reading it, right? So Arnold Murray was used early on to influence me, Robert Murray, James White, and... The reason why I've gotten very angry with James White over the years is because of my intense love for him, right? But no matter how angry I get with this brother, I can't stop loving him. And I want the best for him. And I want him to shine for Jesus Christ. Because look, folks, let's be honest. You'll hear complaints about me. You've heard it. You'll hear it. Sam is too harsh. He's nasty. He's rude. He's a jerk. In fact, even earlier today, I told someone to get lost from my comment section. Uh, because he was complaining that I picked up the phone yesterday. And I said, look, a satanic attack. And he started mocking, saying, ridiculous. So I sent him on his merry way. Right? You with me there? Sent him on his merry way. Told him, don't come back. Okay? I love James White. I really do. He is a genius. He's brilliant. He has been on the front lines. And he's been beaten by the enemy, yet he still stands strong because of the grace of the Holy Spirit, right? He is a blessing to the church. He's done great work. That doesn't mean that everything he says is right, that there aren't things that he holds to that are not mistaken, because there's none of us, none of us with perfect theology. Nobody on this side of eternity, nobody has perfect theology. Our theology is being perfected, right? And I disagree with him passionately on issues concerning, let's say, textual transmission. And by the way, it's not because I'm smarter than him. He'll blow me away when it comes to textual criticism because I, I read others. So some of his positions, let's say, on the long ending of Mark or the pericope adultery, the story of the woman caught in adultery, I disagree with him. I think that there needs to be more balance and the other side needs to be presented. But folks, deep down inside, deep down inside, he is a soldier. He's doing great work. He's had nearly 200 debates. He's taken the best the other side has to offer. And he has met them face to face, went toe to toe with them for the glory of the triune God. If you desire the fall of such an individual, you have to check your heart. Because he's in love with the triune God. And he wants to honor the triune God. And he believes the way he's doing it is honoring to the triune God. Now, everybody has issues. Look at me. I I do not, there's not a day in which I don't hear someone saying, I'm a jerk, I'm angry, I'm rude, I'm nasty. And it's true. I am. I don't lie. <laughs> I am. I am. So, if I'm a stumbling block to you, if I'm a stumbling block to you, do yourself a favor. Go somewhere else and listen to someone else. If you're a stumbling block to me, don't come back because I don't want to stumble and sin against the Lord by being vicious and nasty. But if we're going to condemn people for their imperfections, then you need to start with yourself. Condemn yourself first, right? You get my point? 
So some people have a problem with is Calvinism. But folks, Calvinism is an acceptable expression of the Christian faith. Arminianism is an expe acceptable expression. What do I mean? Calvinist, Calvinism would not exist if there aren't passages in the Bible that really strongly affirm God's sovereignty, perfect knowledge over all events, and his decree that is, how do I put this? That everything takes place in creation, not apart from God's decree, but as a result of God's decree. There are passages that strongly affirm those aspects of Calvinism. But there are passages that strongly affirm aspects of Arminianism. These positions would not exist if there weren't passages that strongly argue, let's say, for the Calvinist understanding of God's sovereignty and perfect knowledge of all events that take place, past, present, and future. But at the same token, Arminianism wouldn't flourish if there weren't passages that strongly support the Arminian understanding of God's knowledge and human responsibility. This is why in Christianity, Calvinism is accepted as a valid expression of Christianity. Arminianism is accepted as a valid expression of Christianity. These are not views that take you outside of the fold of Christianity. You with me there? And the reason why I close Sunday is because I used to be a five-point Calvinist. And close on Sunday, I still believe there's a lot of truth in Calvinism. So I can't simply deny it. But there's so much scripture that has made me rethink my position that that's why I don't call myself a Calvinist Arminian anymore. I'm one confused Christian who's trying to be a biblicist, right? I'm one confused Christian who's trying to be a biblicist. Right, So I just want to say, I wanted to preface this because I saw yesterday's debate. Pray for James White, that God will shine through him and preserve him. He is a mighty soldier of Christ. He is a blessing to the church. Yes, there are issues that people you know, disagree with him on. And yes, he, ha he can be very mean to people, but so can I. Right? And I know some of his stance, uh, positions and stance on certain issues, upsets a lot of people, like the King James and his Calvinism and, and so on. But brother, sister, there is no one on this side of eternity that has perfect theology. Michael Brown, whom I love, there are things with him that I have issues with, and he has issues with me. Name me one Christian. Name me a Christian that doesn't have, have issues, and that Christian is in heaven. Name me one Christian whose theology is flawless, and that Christian is in heaven. No one on earth in this fallen world has perfect theology, is sound in everything he or she affirms, believes, and preaches. And no one on earth in this fallen world does not have issues. Everybody and his mother has issues. And I'm talking about on a psychological, emotional plane. If you ran into some of the apologists that I run into, you think I got issues? I've met some apologists that are out there that are wacky that had not been for the grace of God saving them. They would be in a nut asylum. And the first one is David Wood, and he admits it. Right? Jojo, Momster, it is by design. In fact, brethren, you understand David Wood is a walking miracle? Let me, let me explain, so because I want to get into the issue. You understand David Wood is a walking miracle? Do you understand why? Okay. David Wood is diagnosed. He's a diagnosed sociopath. Sociopath. You understand, if you read the stories of ser serial killers, they're all sociopaths. You understand that if God doesn't constrain this man, the Holy Spirit doesn't constrain this man, this guy can snap. Maybe he can snap and end up killing me. The man is a walking miracle, testimony to the power of the Holy Spirit to constrain someone because the Holy Spirit is all powerful for the glory of Christ. Okay. So don't think apologists, pastors, preachers don't have issues. You would be shocked. And this is another thing. The reason why we struggle with issues, someone said it. Let me explain why. Let me show you the wisdom of God. 
in raising up men who have serious issues, whether mental, emotional issues, right, and struggles. The reason why God does this is, number one, so that no one human person becomes the focus and the center of attention. So that we don't look to one human speaker, right? Number two, it's to show our need of one another. Our need of one another. Just like I have issues and there are areas in which I'm not gifted, areas I fail, but there are brothers and sisters who excel in those areas, so I need them like they need me. So you may need me to teach you, but then I need you for prayers because I'm not gifted in the air of prayer, right? Not that I don't pray, but to be quite honest, I get afraid to pray. Do you know why? Everything I prayed for, I've gotten the opposite. So now... Now I taught myself, if I want this, pray against it, then I'll get it. Did you know that? In fact, the Syrian guy here. No, no, I'm not lying. The Syrian guy is a witness. He's here. He knows. Everything I have prayed for in my situation for the past few years, I've gotten the opposite. I'm being honest. I for Christ. Here, the Syrian guy. Am I lying? He's right there. The Syrian guy. He's right there. He's a witness. Okay. Everything I've asked, I've gotten the opposite. I even told him, I go, man, I'm going to start praying the opposite of what I'm asking for to get it. But the problem is God knows my intention. So that I can't even hide that from God. So if I if I say, look, Lord, uh, deliver me from the judge, I should pray, you know what, Lord, let the judge destroy me. But see, he knows what I really mean. I really mean, give me the opposite of what I'm asking for. So you can't hide it from God. God knows your intention, right? But he's a witness. He's a witness. Everything I prayed for, I've gotten the opposite. In fact, he was there at my court, at my last court. It was August, I believe, somewhere I think 26, right? He was there. A certain guy, can you testify what I'm about to say in front of everyone? I was summoned by the lawyers of my ex-wife. They told the judge that they wanted me to pay because, again, my situation, we've gone to the appellate court. Uh, we've we've went to a higher court of three judges to see how corrupt, how cruel, how unjust the decisions of this judge was with the hope that God would turn their hearts and show me mercy and override some of these decisions, one of which is that the judge awarded them that I pay them $15,000 for my ex-wife's legal fees. Okay? Now, I got a lawyer to contest that to take it to the appellate court. We're still waiting for the decision. They took me to court August saying he hasn't paid. So my lawyer was trying to tell her, well, we're waiting for the appellate court. They're about to decide. The judge shut down my lawyer. He was there. Certain guy, am I lying? Uh, not only did she shut, the, shut, shut my lawyer down, she gave me 60 days from August to pay it. Then it gets worse. Certain guy, am I lying? Look, look, he's right there. Listen, he's writing it. Certain guy. Then they asked for the judge. We also want him to pay $25,000 for responding to his appeal to the appellate court. Guys, understand the logic. They had to appeal, respond to my appeal, that my lawyer appealed to the appellate court. They want $25,000 for it. You know what the judge did? He's there. He's there. A certain guy is there. She goes, you got it. He's got 30 days to pay it. She demanded that I pay their fees for responding to my appeal to the appellate court to override her corrupt decision and gave me 30 days to do it. So that means in 60 days, I had to come up with $40,000. I haven't paid a dime. So that's why now they're summoning me back to court November 20th, which I can't be there. I'm in another state. So pray God's miracle, miraculous power to arise. Syrian guy, am I lying? He's right there. Syrian guy, can you testify to what I'm saying? He's right there. I want you to listen. And this is all recorded. So you lawyers, you can use this against me. See, he's right there. He got so angry that he burst out with emotion and she threw us out of the courtroom. You know what she said in front of him? The Syrian guy is right there. You know what she said to me with a cold, evil, demonic countenance? She said, you did it to yourself. You did it to yourself. That's what she said. That's what she said. And he's right there. He was in my court. Am I lying? Huh? Can you say? 
Well, pray, Akka, because November 20th, they're going to demand that I pay it, and I can't be there. So I told my Lord, I'm not there. I'm in another state. I'm not coming back. So why did I bring this up? See, right there. He's right there. Yeah, and Sai Christian knows, too, from first-hand experience. Now, so what's my point? Why did I mention this? I don't want to go on a tangent because you're not here to hear my personal problems. You're not here for me to rant. I am not gifted to pray. Yes, I do pray because I have to worship the Lord. We have to worship him. So when people tell me pray for me, can I be honest with you? I'm afraid to pray for anyone. You know why I'm afraid? Because every time I pray, I get the opposite. Okay. Every time I pray. So that's why I ask you guys to pray. Because there are among you in the body of Christ that have been gifted by the Spirit to pray for hours in the power of the Spirit and get answers. So that's not my gifting. But some of you have been gifted to pray and be intercessory prayer warriors. I need you. So the Holy Spirit has made it in such a way. No one human person has all the gifts. No one human person is flawless here on earth so that no one human person becomes the attention and the focus of Christians, of Christianity. And so that no one human person thinks that he or she is self-sufficient and doesn't need the other members of the body of Christ. This is the beauty, this is the wisdom, this is the glory of why God has raised up imperfect fallen human beings that he's perfecting to do what they do in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's not my gifting to pray. And I'll be honest with you guys, honest with you guys. When people tell me to pray, I don't say yes or no because I'm being honest, I'm confessing. I'm afraid to pray for anyone. You know why? Because I've gotten the opposite of what I prayed for. This is why when people tell me, right, people tell me, hey, you know, God has great plans for you. Folks, I know you mean well. I know you mean well. God's great plans for us is that we will enter his presence and be perfected forever. Well, there'll be no more pain, no more sin, no more misery, no more depression, no more satanic onslaughts, no more diseases, no more death. That's what God has promised me. But until then, as I expounded on the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, until then, God has promised me trials and tribulations in this world and a devil who's going to try to destroy me, but he's given me the assurance that no matter what the world throws at me, he will preserve me by his infinite power, infinite love, by the Spirit, so that it won't consume me, but I will endure till the end for his glory. That's what he's promised me. You get it? Choose. It's definitely being tested. But I will only pass by the power of the Holy Spirit filling me and cleaving to the Holy Spirit of God. You get my point? You see what I say? Okay, so I went on this rant. Forgive me, folks, because I'm trying to teach you not just theology, but practical application and the reality of the Christian walk. Many people have the wrong view of Christianity. They think they come to Christ and everything will be okay. No, that's when your problems get worse. When Satan sees you have escaped the kingdom of darkness and now belong to the kingdom of light, he now sees you as enemy number one and now will come after you more viciously to destroy you because now you're a threat against his kingdom. Serene, I've been exhausted. Serene, S-E-R-I-N-09, I've been exhausted. And this is a testimony of how real the Holy Spirit is to be able to energize me, empower me, and fill me to be able to teach and endure because I cannot do it. I don't have the strength to do it. It is the Holy Spirit of God in us. It's his power, his strength. I'm tired. Let me be honest. I'm not trying to get in a rant or a pity party. But I'm trying to open my heart to you guys. I am tired of going home, sleeping alone without my children. I'm tired of waking up without the sound of my children. I'm tired of not feeling at home anywhere I go. I'm tired of sitting in a bookstore, writing articles, and then looking at parents with their children. 
looking at couples madly in love with each other. And I'm sitting there alone, sipping on my coffee, wondering, how are my daughters right now? Are they asking for me? Are they crying? Are they okay? How are they in being impacted by different men being introduced to their lives and their fathers? That are? It's tiring. But can I tell you something? Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. And I can tell you from my heart, I can tell you from my heart, I mean this. I love Jesus more than I've le ever loved him before. I know, soldier of Christ, we're in the same boat. You, soldier of Christ, me, even Sai Christian. I love him more than I've ever loved him before. In fact, I've never cried as much as I cry now. Before, I, I, I wasn't a crier. Now, I'm being honest. Every time I think of Jesus and I reflect on his beauty, I cry like a baby. Because through this, he's made my heart more tender and more in love with him. And folks, I'm saying this. I, don't want, you, I don't want you to get misunderstand this and take this the wrong way. Don't take this the wrong way. I've never wanted to leave this world and be with him more so than now. I'm ready to leave. I tell him that every day. I go, Lord, this world is miserable. This world stinks. And I hate this world. And I'm ready to leave, Lord. I'm ready to check out. Your time, not mine. Your time, not mine. I'm ready to go home. I just want to be in your presence where I can kiss your beautiful feet from my heart. Kiss your beautiful feet, your glorified physical body that has physical feet. I want to just sit and I just want to rest at your feet and kiss your feet. <clears throat> just kiss your feet. I want to see all my heroes in the faith. I want to see the blessed Apostle Paul. I'm not worthy to be in his company, but by your grace, I know I'll enter. And I just want to sit with Paul, and I want to talk to Paul, right? I also want to see your blessed mother. I want to see the face of the one who carried you in her womb and gave you your physical body, your human nature. I want to see that woman, and I want to be embraced by her, to be hugged by her, <clears throat> just to see your mother. And I also want to hear, also want to hear once again, right? Once again, the voice of my mother. Guys, you don't know, I'm the youngest of six and I was her baby, right? And <clears throat> when I got married and she wasn't around that long to see my youngest, but she was around to see my oldest, and she used to love and adore my oldest because she was the baby of her baby. She was the baby, right, of her baby, and she just adored my daughter. And you want to hear what's amazing, guys? You know what's amazing? You want to see how good Jesus is? Do you guys want to see how beautiful he is, how good he is? My mother passed away. March 12, 2014, when my daughter turned four, the Lord took my mother on the birthday of my firstborn, March 12, 2014. My daughter was born March 12, 2010. Wednesday, March 12, 2014, the Lord took her home. And you know why? Because when I looked at my daughter's face, it made it so easy to let my mother go. And I wasn't as devastated as I could have been. Because when I saw my firstborn look at my face and smiling and then hugging me and telling me, I love you, Baba, the world was mine. You know that? The world was mine. And so I ache to hear the voice of my mother. I ache to enter the presence of the Lord. And I see my mother <clears throat> and I hear her voice again. Calling me by name. 
She used to have a unique name that she called me. I don't want to mention it now because I don't want my enemies to know. To hear her voice and to fall in her arms and say, Yimmi. Saying it in Majilu tongue, right? Die. This time, death will never separate us again because of Jesus. Anyway. All right. Anyway, guys. Sorry for the long rant. I just was trying to talk about James White. I love the man and our imperfections. And we got to love each other. And we got to bear with one another. And we got to forgive one another. I mean... I'm not talking about ignore blatant sin. If you have someone who is committing adultery, no, 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 no. You don't put up with that. You call call that out, rebuke that person to repent. Sexual morality, whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. We have to hold brothers and sisters who claim to be Christian accountable to the word. I'm talking about, let's say, certain issues, personality flaws, imperfections that people struggle with or may not even think they're struggling with, that's a different story. William Lane Craig is one of the greatest apologists that God has raised. But he has issues too, theologically, right? Traditional apostolic churches are not comfortable with him because he does not affirm Nicene Christology. In other words, he believes that the language of eternal begetting of the Son, eternal procession of the Spirit, are outdated modes of expressing the relationship of the members of the Godhead. So he rejects that language. In fact, if you read him carefully, William Lane Craig believes that the titles Father and Son are roles that they took in respect to creation, but it doesn't tell us about their eternal relationship. In other words, Jesus is the Son by virtue of the role he assumes in becoming to the earth to become flesh, to redeem it, and the father is called the father in that regard, but he doesn't believe that these are titles or names that tell us what they are eternally before creation. You get my point? So these are issues that, though are serious and I take issues with, that doesn't mean he's not a true Christian. It doesn't mean he's not a brother in Christ. He is a true He still believes in the Trinity. He believes there are three eternal divine persons. And that the person of Christ is an eternal divine person who existed before creation, distinct from the one we call the Father and the one we call the Spirit. So he's a Trinitarian. I believe Jesus is the God-man, one of the best defenders of the existence of God and the historical reality of Jesus' physical bodily resurrection. Right. So solid, but there's issues in which historically, in other words, put it this way. If he was living at the time of Athanasius and he held to these views, he would have been condemned as a heretic. No doubt about it, right? Many of us, if we were living at the time of the early church fathers, we'd be condemned as heretics. No doubt about it. You know that, right? Many of you who are Baptists, Calvinists, and let's say you don't believe in infant baptism and you don't believe in water baptismal regeneration, the church of the 3rd and 4th and 5th centuries would have condemned all of us as heretics and demanded we repent or be ostracized from the church. Did you know that? You get it? Why do you keep asking me about personalities, I for Christ? Better question is, do I consider you a Christian? Now notice I for Christ, one for Christ. He's telling me, what about William Lane Craig, Martin Luther? Friend, am I God? Do you want me to now pass judgment? Everyone, I want to pass judgment on you. What about you? Who are you? I don't know you. You're a heretic. Dude, can you stop mentioning people's names? My goodness. Next, you're going to ask me, what about Paul, the apostle? Why don't you ask me about him so I can sit in judgment of him? <laughs> Man, dude. I know them. Who are you? It's like the demon said. When the seven sons of Sceva said, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preached, we cast you out. And then, then the demon said, Jesus we know, Paul we know, but who are you? Same thing with you, I won for Christ. William Lane Craig I know, Athanasius I know, but who are you? And I'm not saying because I'm a demon. <laughs> God forbid. 
guys here talking about William Lane Craig. What about WLC? Huh? What about Luther? And he says Lutheran instead of Luther. How about, why don't you just ask me about Peter while you're at it? But now let's come back to the issue. All of this to say, James White did a phenomenal job yesterday. The only thing I, I take issue with, let me be upfront because we're going to go into the gospel, Old Testament saints, Trinity, Tawheed. We're going to go into a lot of meat if you're ready for it. And I hope, even though I took 44 minutes of your time, I hope that the things I said still blessed you, edified you, convicted you, and by the power of the Holy Spirit that my words were used to cause you to fall more passionate in love with Jesus. I hope because I don't want to waste your time. And I'm not here for a pity party and talk about my issues, but I'm trying to be a brother and being honest with you and open my heart to you. Right? Okay, now, Shabir Ali is one of the most wickedly deceitful, dishonest Mohammedans out there. Right? Shabir Ali also, because he is of his father, the devil, and follows the sunnah of his prophet Muhammad, when he challenges Christians to debate, rarely, if at all, will he debate exclusively on Islamic topics. Very rare. So he'll try to combine two topics in one so he can spend most of his time attacking the Christian topic and rarely defending his own satanic beliefs. So he'll debate Trinity versus Tawheed or the Bible or the Quran. So here's my open challenge. And I want you to pass this on to Shabra Ali. Tell him, well, you don't say, because if I say he's a coward and he's he's a son of Satan, he's going to use that as an excuse not to debate me. But tell him, Sam Shimon is debating you to debate, does the Quran teach Tawheed? Separate topic. And does the Bible teach the Trinity? Two separate topics. Not two topics in one where you spend all your time criticizing tr the Trinity, but rarely defending your false satanic view in Tawheed. Because I promise you by the triumph God, I will decimate him and send him to retirement. Okay, so challenge him. Sam Shimon says he wants to debate you on two topics. Does the Quran teach Tawheed? And then another topic, does the Bible teach the Trinity? Separately. Okay, and also Sam Shimon challenging you to debate, is the Quran the word of God? And a separate topic, did Muhammad believe the Bible is the uncorrupt word of God? So guys, pass it on. I promise you, by the power of the triumph God, I will decimate him and send him into e early retirement. Okay? Well, with that said, James White did a fabulous job. So I want to talk about a little bit about Trinity, Tawheed, Old Testament saints. I promise you, if you guys are praying, pray for me, especially you prayer for warriors. Pray God helps me to get healthier. Pray God helps me to be holier and truly in love with Jesus, not hypocrite. Pray the Spirit will fill me with more wisdom and knowledge, understanding in the Scriptures to plunge the depth of Scriptures so I can bless you. Pray for the finances to come in to do the work of the Lord. Pray that God will protect my daughters. Fight against this wicked judge. Don't forget, November 20th. Pray God will turn her heart in my favor and silence this wicked judge, agent of Satan. Because I'm in another state. I can't be there. I'm not going there. And pray that my daughters will come to me sooner than later because Thanksgiving is around the corner. Christmas is around the corner. And they won't be with me. If you pray for that, I'll continue to serve you until the Lord calls me home. And I'll be honest, if the Lord were to let me know you're coming home this year, take me. Because I want you to remember this before I get into topic. And I mean this. Remember these words. If you forget anything I teach you, one thing I want you to remember. And I mean it from my heart. You don't need me and you've never needed me. I know some of you in your love will say, we need you. No, you don't. All you need is the triune God. All you need is Jesus. Because when I leave this world, Jesus will still be on the throne, almighty to save, and still raising up people to build up his church. Jesus has been building his church for nearly 2,000 years, long before I existed. And if he tarries, he's going to continue Continue to build his church long before I'm gone. I mean, long after. Lord, forgive me. Holy Spirit, protect me from her. I'm gone. It is an honor. It is an honor that the Lord would use me to bless you. It's an honor. It's an honor that of all my siblings, the six children of my mother and father were six. 
He would point the finger at me and say, of all of them, I'm going to set you apart and I'm going to raise you up to serve me because he could have chose any of my siblings, but he chose me. It is an honor that my Lord <clears throat> would call me apart for his glory. <clears throat> right? It's an honor. But Jesus has been building the church before I existed and will continue to build this church after I'm gone, because the, the church depends on Jesus for its <clears throat> life. And Jesus can never die. He lives forever, and he's almighty to save, one with the Father and the Spirit. And he'll always bless his church, love his church, preserve his church until he returns. So don't ever think this, that you need me. You don't. And I'm not being humble. You don't. You don't. It is an honor that the Lord uses me to bless you. And when I'm gone, he will still be there because Jesus is the one who says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And I am with you always to the end of the age because he lives forever. He ever lives. He can never fail us, right? So with that said, let's talk about a passage that came up that's a nightmare for Unitarians, especially Muslims. And James White did a phenomenal job. But the problem is, again, because it's two topics in one. Excuse me. Two topics. Two topics in one. What did Shibra Ali spent most of his time doing? God bless you, Aiden. What did Shibra Ali spend most of his time doing? And criticizing the Trinity. You get it? Criticizing, you see why he sets up the debate, Trinity versus Tawheed? So he can just in passing say, the Quran teaches one God, Allah is one, not three in one, and that's what we're calling you to worship, and let's bash the Trinity. But because James White is a top-notch, world-class debater and knowledgeable in scriptures, he did an excellent job of putting him in his place, even with time constraints. But see, this is why, Christians, please be smarter. Do not let the Muslims set the agenda and do not accept their topics. Demand two topics. One, does the Quran teach Tawheed? And then another topic, we can do it the same day or on successive days, successive nights. Does the Bible teach the Trinity? Yeah, it was yesterday, Vine. But I was watching the unprofessional recording. Where they didn't get all of it. The professional recording should be coming out this week, God willing, and I will send you a link. And it, Which reminds me, by the way, reminds me, James White updated his book, The Forgotten Trinity. Make sure you get that. I've said it. I'll say it again. One of the best primers on the Trinity, one of the best books written for the beginning intermediate stages of Christians who want to know the Trinity is James, one's, James White's book, The Forgotten Trinity. The updated version just came out November 5. Get the updated version. If you want to read the older version, here it is as a PDF file free of charge. Praise Jesus for modern technology. Here is the link to the older version. Well, medic, it's okay. Here it is, free. That's the link to the older version. There you go. What's HD? What are you talking about, HD? Uh, well, he's made some... Typos, I'm sorry, he's made some corrections to typos, updated some information, but basically it's, you're getting, it's probably 98% of the same. There are a few changes here and there, right? Some typos that he corrected, updated, you know, some, some of the details and so forth, and took some of the end notes and put them in the main text. But overall, if you read this, phenomenal, yes. And another book. Another book that I highly recommend. This one is superb. In fact, before I begin again, I said that some of the men that God used to influence me were Robert Murray, Arnold Murray, and I have to do some talks on Arnold Murray because now that I told you about Arnold Murray, you're going to run and listen to a shepherd's chapel, and he taught some things that are out there that I need to correct by the grace of the triumph God, which I will, Lord willing. James White, these were three of the many that God used early on through their talks and their writings. Robert Morey wrote one of the best books on the Trinity called Trinity, Evidence, and Issues. Trinity, Evidence, and Issues. This is one of the first books, 
and one of the first scholars that introduced me to the Old Testament evidence for the Trinity. One of the first scholars, one of the first books that introduced me to the angel of Jehovah being the pre-human appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. Using the Old Testament to prove the Holy Spirit is God in a person. One of the first books that introduced me to the fact that in the Hebrew Old Testament, plural adjectives, plural part participles, plural verbs are used of the one true God. Not just pro, uh, plural pronouns or pr plural nouns. Amazing. Now, one thing I need to <clears throat> tell you off the bat. The problem with Maury's book is that he doesn't provide transliterations of the Hebrew or the Greek. He'll give you the Hebrew, he gives you the Greek, but doesn't translate them for you, so you have no clue what the Hebrew word is. You have no clue what the Greek word is unless you read Hebrew and or Greek. And there are a lot of typos, a lot of typos. Whoever edited the book did a terrible job. And there's another one. Some of the things he said about some of the sources were wrong. So with those three caveats, he doesn't give you a translation or a transliteration of the Hebrew and Greek that he uses, right? A lot of typos and some of the information about some of the sources, like the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha, they were wrong, mistaken. But besides that, overall, the book is, has me and is excellent and even shows you and introduces you to logic, how to use logic, and the different ways in which we arrive at truth. How do we arrive at truth? How do we know something is true? He introduces you to the inductive method and the deductive method, and he tells you that he's going to use the deductive method. It is an excellent book. Right? You guys with me? You got that so far? Lisa, God bless you. You keep telling me I'm cute, I'm handsome, and I hope you mean that from your heart. You know, one thing I've always struggled with, I've always struggled with believing that I was good looking and attractive. That's one of the thorns in my side. Uh, Justin H., the name is Trinity Evidence and Issues. Trinity Evidence and Issues. I wish I could find you a PDF file of it, but I can't. It's not online. Superb. Yes, Johannes. I am Jilwaya. I am Jilu from Assyria. I'm from the tribe of Jilu. Jilu Jilwaya. How did you know, man, Johannes? Hater? Close on Sunday. Thank you for that affirmation because you know what my pray prayer has been? That God would use me to teach people the depth and beauty of the scriptures as the Holy Spirit unveils the depth and beauty of the scriptures to me so that people could learn and not be intimidated by PhDs and scholars because they'll receive knowledge that rivals theirs, if not surpasses theirs, by the power of the Holy Spirit because this kind of information you should be getting in your churches, not be sent off to institutions to be teaching you what the church is supposed to teach you. If you look at church history, look at the early church fathers, they didn't send people to seminaries, right? They taught people in the congregation and educate them what the Bible was all about, what it meant, how to apply it for the glory of the triune God. Okay, now, with that said, let's come back. And deal with a passage that's going to bless you across the board because it's going to refute Jehovah's Witnesses and Muslims and show you again with great clarity that Jesus Christ is Jehovah in the flesh, is thing from the Father. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 4 to 6. Thank you, Pessy Jeff. Man, more confirmation from the Lord. Pessy Jeff just said, you've expounded biblical knowledge I haven't learned in seminaries. Now, Pessy, thank the triumph God, praise the triumph God, Glorify the triumph God, fall more in love with him, because that's the grace of the triumph God. And pray that I'll be filled with the Spirit to continue to do this. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 4 to 6. I will go into, I, I haven't forgotten, I will show you how the Old Testament saints were saved. But let's just unpack this, let me just do this. 1 Corinthians 8, verses 4 to 6. 16, 11, God bless. Guys, you're spoiling me today. I don't know, it's because I got emotional on you and... And you're just trying to love on me. You're spoiling me today. You really are. Right? 
All right. First Corinthians 8, verses 4 to 6. Let's read this, and we're going to focus on verse 6. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered and sacrificed unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. This is what we call the Shema, and I'll expound, that, expound on it in a minute. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are gods many and lords many, but to us, we believers, born of the Spirit, who profess to be Christians, to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Now, let me tell you why the Bible is amazing, supernatural, divine in origin. A lot of times, the authors of the Bible will make passing comments as they're addressing another issue. But in making those comments, they give us a window into the beliefs and practices of the churches at that time. Okay, what do I mean? In 1 Corinthians 8, Paul's point is not to teach theology, meaning the nature of God and the persons of God. One second. Right? That's, that's not what he's doing here. He's mentioning an issue that arose among the Christians living at Corinth. The issue of, okay, we used to be pagans. We worship at temples. We used to, we used to worship idols. And we would eat meat, sacrificed idols. And now that we're believers, we still have family members that do that. Paul, how should we go about dealing with this issue? That's the issue of 1 Corinthians 8. That's the context. The context is not a, a primer on theology. How many gods are there and how many persons of this God? He mentions that in passing. See, this is what makes the scripture so amazing. The authors will address one issue, but in addressing that issue, they make a comment in passing that gives us a window into the beliefs and practices of the Christians at that time. You understand what I'm what I'm saying here? Exactly, Justin H. You, 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 you nailed it. Refuting heresies that they're not even addressing because that's not the topic. The topic of 1 Corinthians 8, don't take my word for it. Read it. It's about... Paul, we used to be pagans. We used to worship Zeus and Artemis and commit these gross sexual perverted acts with the shrine prostitutes. I don't know if you know this. A practice common among the pagans is that they would have shrine prostitutes, quote unquote female priestesses, that would engage in sexual immorality with the worshipers as an act of worship to the gods and goddesses. Do you know that? This was part and parcel of their wicked, filthy, immoral practices. They did this during the Old Testament period. They were doing it at the time of Paul. What they call shrine prostitutes. Male and female shrine prostitutes. Right? Male and female shrine prostitutes. So can you imagine you're at Corinth, you're passing by a temple, and there's a female prostitute, a female priestess, who's now enticing you to engage in an act, sexually immoral act, as an act of worship. Exactly growing. Holy sex, ancient word, right? Okay, so now these Corinthians are now followers of Jesus. They've renounced such perverted practices. They've renounced the worship of gods and goddesses and do not... Partake of meats, offer titles. But Paul, we got a problem. My mother's still an idolatrous. My dad is an idolater. I'm invited to their home, and they're offering me meat. But that meat was offered to the gods and goddesses. In the temple, they brought it home. What do I do? My mom wants me to go to temple with her. What do I do, Paul? You see the issues addressing in 1 Corinthians 8? Exactly, Riaz. God bless you guys. A lot of sharp brothers and sisters filled with wisdom from the spirit. Ritual, sexual, perversion. Exactly, medic. Okay, this is what Paul is addressing. In addressing it, he mentions, look, I know that to the world there are many gods, many goddesses, many lords. That's what they think. Well, we know better. We know there's only one God, the Father, one Lord Jesus Christ. So in this world, unfortunately, there are gods, goddesses, and lords. Many. Because the pagans think 
These are actual gods and goddesses and lords that actually exist, but little do they realize these are demon, demons and Satan himself. Satan and demons appearing as gods, goddesses, and lords to deceive them from the worship of the one true God. You understand what Paul is saying? But we know better. We know there's only one God, the Father, and one Lord Jesus Christ. So notice why he mentions that. He mentions it, mentions that in passing in addressing another issue. Thank God he did. Thank God he did. Thank God for their question. Because in asking that question, the Spirit moved Paul to write in such a way that tells us their view of the Godhead. Right? Don't forget, even critical scholars like Bart Ehrman will date the writing of 1 Corinthians to 55 AD. Yes, thank you. 55 AD. Okay, 55 AD. Now, let us approximate the date of the resurrection of our Lord around, let's say, 33 AD. By the way, Protestant believer says, hi, child of God. Says hi. He won't show his handsome face, but, you know, child of God knows it. Okay, how many years after the resurrection is Paul writing this letter? 55 AD, even someone like Bart Ehrman dates it to around 55 AD. The Lord, let's say, was raised 33. Some actually put, put it at 30, 36 AD. 33 AD. Protestant believer said, hi, child of God. Hi, brother. How are you? Okay. Thank you. He goes, hi, how are you doing? 22 years, right? Within 22 years, folks, let it sink in. Within 22 years. Not only Jews like Paul, Greeks worshiping gods and goddesses galore are now worshiping an historical Jew who had just been recently been crucified. A historical a Jew, a Jew. They're worshiping him as the one Lord of all creation, by whom God the Father created everything. Within 22 years, they're already doing this. What would lead pagans to start worshiping a Jew who didn't live 100 years beforehand, who lived within their lifetime, who had just been crucified 20 years earlier, start worshiping that Jew as the one Lord of all creation by whom God the Father brought all things into existence? You understand how astonishing this testimony is? Do you understand how astonishing what you're reading before you? See, we read this, but we just pass over it and not understand how astonishing this statement is in that Jewish monotheists and a group of Greek pagans, all of them unite in the worship of a Jew who had just been crucified 20 years earlier and worship this Jew as the risen Lord, who's the one Lord of all creation, by whom God brought all creation into being. You see why this is astonishing? See why I'm trying to unpack this? Folks, why would a Greek abandon Zeus or Hermes? Zeus in, in Romans was Jupiter. Artemis, Diana, for a Jew who less than 20 years ago was beaten to bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, spiked on a cross, died and was buried, abandoned them for that Jew. Sinking in? You understand the evidence that God has given you in the books of the Bible to show that this Jesus of history left the tomb empty, came to life because that's the only explanation for why countless Gentiles and monotheistic Jews would all unite in their worship of this Jew. How do you explain it naturalistically apart from the resurrection? How? Convince me to be an atheist. Explain to me the birth of the church. Explain to me why droves of Gentiles, like Vine said, give up their cult a cult that would allow them to engage, for lack of a better term, orgies with immunity. 
worshiping gods and goddesses, give that all up and be persecuted by their own family members and their own communities because they abandoned that for a worship of a Jew who had lived less than 20 years earlier, who had been beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, spiked to death on a cross, and they come and worship him. How do you explain that naturalistically? How do you explain that naturalistically? Now, the second thing I want you to catch with 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. The second thing I want you to catch with 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. Let's look at it again. See, this is where I want the Holy Spirit to illuminate us and help us to see the depth of this, this word. The ocean that is called the Bible. It is an ocean, the depths of which we cannot plumb. Now watch. Watch. But to us there is but one God the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. I don't know if you caught it. The second thing that you should catch if you're paying attention is, did you realize that Paul doesn't have to defend what he just said? He doesn't take a moment saying, here's why you should believe there's only one God the Father, one Lord Jesus Christ, and that the Father and Son together are the cause of all creation, and they're the ones who sustain us. He doesn't have to explain that. He doesn't have to defend it. He takes it as a given that the people's writing to believe that already and affirm it already and have no problems with that assertion. He takes it as a given. They're all on board with me. They all agree with this. Now, can you imagine you're going to a mosque or a Hindu temple and say, there's one God, the Father, one Lord Jesus Christ, that's it. You're going to have to do a lot of explaining, a lot of defending, a lot of refuting, because you're going to have objectors. Wait, what do you mean? What do you mean one God, the Father, one Lord? No, 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 no. You're... You think you're going to get away with that statement? Are you, you think you're going to get away with that statement? If you made that statement in a mosque, in a Hindu temple, or among atheists, don't you think that you're going to now spend more time explaining, defending, and refuting objections against that assertion? But why is it Paul can mention this in passing and didn't feel the need to defend that or explain it, but simply take it as a given that his audience is already on board and they believe what he's about to write. You know why? Because long before the writing of 1 Corinthians, these Gentiles had already been catechized to believe that. They already taught this, and they already believed this, and affirmed it, and were willing to die for it. You get what, what I'm trying to say here? That though 1 Corinthians written 55 A.D., the statement that there's one God, the Father, one Lord Jesus Christ, both of whom are the reason why all creation came into being and why we live, because they sustain us, was something already taught to them years prior to the letter, something they already came to believe and affirm and live in light of that revelation. Meaning this knowledge of there being one God, the Father, one Lord Jesus Christ, was something already hammered, anchored in their minds, in their hearts, Long before 55 AD. You see how early this affirmation is? You with me there? Do you say, do you see, say, Lord, lose my time, Holy Spirit, protect me from here. How early this affirmation is? That means, that means, if he's writing 55 AD, and these people have been Christians for a while. At the very earliest, let me let's say latest, this was something that they already affirmed and believed in the 40s. In fact, I have a statement from Bart Ehrman. It's in one of my articles. I'll look for it and I'll read it. Bart Ehrman in his book, How Jesus Became God. This is in his book. He says, the Carmen Christi, the hymn to Christ in Philippians 2, 5-11, didn't originate with Paul, and Paul may have been quoting a poem. He's not certain whether Paul composed it or someone else, but he says the theology of Philippians 2, 5 to 11 didn't originate with Paul, but it was something believed on already before Paul converted 
and something that was already there in the early 40s. 40s AD, folks. So he's admitting that this hymn, he believes it's a poem, may have been composed by Paul. That hymn was the belief of the Christians before Paul converted. And this is something already believed on in the 40s, early 40s. Let me find it. Let me get my article. Now let me tell you why that's astonishing. Let me tell you why that's astonishing. Let me get it for you. And conveniently, I titled it, Bart Ehrman Proves That Muhammad Is a False Prophet. Because they love to quote Bart Ehrman. I go, all right, Bart Ehrman you want, right? I have a series called Bart D. Ehrman Proves Muhammad Is a False Prophet. Part one, part two, part three. Let me give you the links here. Because they love to quote Bart Ehrman. I go, okay, let me now quote Bart Ehrman. Since he's your new messenger, the new shahad is, La ilaha illallah, Bart Ehrman, Rasulallah. There is no God but Allah, and Bart Ehrman is his messenger. So now since you love him, now, I'm going to use him to destroy Islam and prove Muhammad is an agent of Satan, a son of Satan. Because you quote him, right, Muslims? You're stuck with him. So in this book, here's part one. Save the links, folks. That's part one. Save the links. Okay? This was written specifically to use Bart Ehrman against Muslims who swear by him to show Muhammad is an antichrist. Can't have your cake and eat it too. Here you go. This is part two. Part two. And I'm going to give you the quote. Here's the quote. It's in part two. Here it is. The Carmen Christie. Look what he says, folks. I'm going to quote it in bits and pieces, and I'll read it for you. It's in part two. Save the links. Exactly. Bart Ehrman, peace be upon him. Save the links. I'm going to give you part three. Here you go. This comes from his book, How Jesus Became God. Yeah. <laughs> Riaz and Protestant, you guys are hilarious. Okay, read with me. Okay, hold on. Sorry about that. Okay, well, it's not going. Hold on, let me get it. All right, anyway, let's read now. Send my part two, let me read it. You ready? So, some scholars have had a real difficulty imagining that a po poem existing before Paul's letters to the Philippians. Now notice what he said. A poem whose composition must therefore date as early as the 40s Christian era, CE, could already celebrate an incarnational understanding of Jesus. He says some scholars have a hard time believing it, but guess what? Already in the 40s, they believe Jesus is the incarnation of a pre-existent divine being he says that Philippians 2 shows that Jesus is the human incarnation of the divine angel of Jehovah of the Old Testament. That's what he believes. And he says that this poem was com composed as early as the 40s Christian era. Let me give you the link to part two again. And if you read it, Bart Ehrman. I love Bart Ehrman. You guys hate Bart Ehrman. No. Bart Ehrman is an unbeliever who makes admissions that end up proving tr the Christ of tr truth of Christianity, end up proving the Christian faith and exposing atheism, agnosticism, Islam, and any other ism because he has no naturalistic explanation of why already as early as the 40s, a group of Jews are worshiping this Jew Jesus as the incarnation of of the Old Testament angel of Jehovah. Thank you, Bart Ehrman. If it was based on facts, the whole world would be Christian. But it's not based on facts. Because we have people dead in sin, hardened by sin, influenced by Satan, who even if the facts were to slap them in the face, they couldn't accept it, they would reject it and suppress it, like Paul said. You have Bart Ehrman admitting, folks. I just gave you the quote. That was part two. Make sure I'm going to give you now the, clean, the link to part three. Bart Ehrman admitting, folks, admitting that the Carmen Christie, Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11, right? 
was composed as early as the 40s Christian era. 40s Christian era. Here's part three. That's the second half of part two. There it goes. Right there. Save those links. And he's admitting that this poem celebrates Jesus as the human incarnation, the enfleshment of the angel of Jehovah of the Old Testament. And then Bart Ehrman admits in the articles, I quote him, read it, that the angel of Jehovah is the visible appearance of Jehovah God. So he's admitting that if Jesus is the angel of Jehovah God who became flesh, then Jesus is that visible manifestation of Jehovah of the Old Testament who became flesh. What else do you want? And this was believed on in the 40s by those who came became before Paul. And in fact, it's not in the 40s, folks. He's saying the poem is written in the 40s, Christian era. Well, if there's a poem written in the 40s, then that poem is articulating what they believed before the poem was composed, right? If I wrote a poem indicating my belief, that means I must have believed it before I wrote the poem. So that means you're pushing it now in the 30s. Thank you, Bart Ehrman. In the 30s, where thousands and thousands of eyewitnesses to historical Jesus, both friendly and hostile, his own followers are still alive, and he's admitting that they are proclaiming Jesus as the divine angel of Jehovah of the Old Testament who became flesh. What else do you want, folks, that Christianity is true? When your own enemy is helping you prove the truth of Christianity. What else do you want? You guys want anything else? That's why I love Bart Ehrman. That's why my heart breaks for Bart Ehrman. Because this man knows so much truth that I promise you he's not happy in his life. I promise you there are days where he's thinking to himself, man, if Jesus is alive and God is real, I'm in trouble. In fact, I was told, I didn't read this, but I was told because I heard it in the debate between Michael Brown and Bart Ehrman. Michael Brown mentions that Bart Ehrman admitted there are times in which he wakes up in a cold sweat fearing whether hell is real. Do you know that? The man cannot live in peace with himself because as an historian, he knows these are facts. Fact. He admits it. Guys, he admits it in his writing. In fact, he did the debate with Robert Fung, who denies that Jesus existed and questions whether Paul existed. And Bart Ehrman schooled him in the debate, proving there is no serious historian who can refute on historical grounds the existence of Jesus. We know Jesus existed. For those of you who think he doesn't exist, you are a joke, basically. He schooled them in the debate. It's on YouTube. Bart Ehrman versus Robert Fung. And he's admitting as an historian, Jesus was killed by crucifixion. Now, he denies that he was buried by Joseph of Arimathea. He thinks that the body was deposed of. But he admits as a fact of history, he admits this, that Peter and Mary Magdalene were some of Jesus' own followers who saw visions where they were convinced Jesus had been raised physically to life and physically taken into heaven and now reigns physically in heaven as God. He admits Peter and Mary had visions convincing them of these facts, and they went around preaching those facts. God raised Jesus physically. He's alive physically. He reigns as God physically and will return physically. He admits these as facts of history. Wow. And Muslims, you want to use him? Muslims, he's telling you the Hawariyun, the disciples of Jesus, whom the Quran says were Muslims. They went around saying Jesus was killed by crucifixion. God raised him physically to life. Jesus is alive physically in heaven and rules as God. And he admits that the first generation, even the eyewitnesses of Jesus, within 10 years were preaching that Jesus is the divine angel of Jehovah of the Old Testament who became flesh. Folks, do you see the overwhelming evidence that God has given for the truth of Christianity and the truth of the Bible? 
Therefore, if any of us walk away and deny Christ, we deserve hell. Because we live at a time where God has made the truth of Christianity so irrefutable that to deny Christ, you show you deserve the wrath to come. Right? Life is good. Excellent. Notice what she said. Proving that having knowledge does not save. Exactly. But God is not done with Bart. Bart, I, I won't doubt if he comes to saving faith at the end of his life. Right? So what do we have in 1 Corinthians 8? Follow with me, because I hope this is still blessing you, challenging you, because it's not just refuting anti-Trinitarians. It's helping you appreciate the depth, the beauty, the majesty of the Bible, and learn how to interpret Scripture and pick up on these nuggets. Pick up on these nuggets. Notice the nugget that you learn. Paul is addressing sa sacrifices to idols. And should we eat such sacrifices? And in passing, makes a comment about the nature of the Godhead. A comment that shows even before his writing, already before 55 AD, Gentiles, Jews, are united in their worship of Jesus as God, one with the Father, the agent of creation. Doesn't need to explain it, doesn't need to defend it, doesn't need to unpack it. He knows that the people he's writing to already believe it. Right? And let me give you a nugget to go with this, and I want to pack 1 Corinthians 8, 6. And Lord willing, we'll do a part two on this. I'm still going to finish the series I've begun by the grace of the triumph God. Salvation of the Old Testament saints. Jesus, not the archangel Michael. The synoptic gospel's witness to Jesus being God in the flesh. Other topics related to, let's say, sanctification, holiness, worship. As the Spirit fills me, I'll continue to do this to bless you for the glory of Christ. Now, now, go to 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. First Corinthians 1 verse 2. Are you guys actually amazed that Bart Ehrman made these candid admissions? I'll talk about Melchizedek today. How about that? I got an article on it, Romans 10, verse 9, and I'll talk about it. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. Pay attention, folks. Read this. Same Corinthians, 55 AD. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, call upon, call upon, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. If you remember in the previous sessions, I already went through this and unpacked the implication of it. But now let me remind you, because we're creatures of repetition, hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature by the grace of God's Spirit. Paul is saying in 55 AD, the Christians were united and characterized by this practice. Christians everywhere held this in common. Christians everywhere were known for this practice. Christians everywhere were characterized by this practice. What practice? Calling on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have, we have become known for this practice. Wherever there are Christians, this is what defines us, characterizes us, this practice of calling on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Now who's doing this? Jews and Gentiles. Paul, a monotheistic Jew, and Gentiles, Greeks, abandoning the worship of their gods and goddesses, uniting with monotheistic, monotheistic Jews in this practice, which now defines them, calling on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why is that astonishing? Genesis 21, 33. Genesis 21, 33. Genesis 21, 33. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba, and called there on the name of Jehovah, the everlasting God. What? They called on the name of Jehovah, the everlasting God? <whistles> Paul, you said by 55 AD, Christians had spread over the then known world, and they were united in this practice, known for this practice, characterized by this practice of calling on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, Jews and Gentiles. What? Are you serious, Paul? Psalm 99. 
Psalm 99. <clears throat> six and seven. Psalm 99, six and seven. Five to seven. Let's start at five. Psalm 99, five to seven. But the key verse is going to be six and seven, specifically even seven, right? Six and seven. Psalm 99, five to seven. Six is the key along with seven. Pay attention. But I want to add five for context. Watch here. Psalm 99, 5 to 7. Pay attention to 6 and 7. Exalt ye Jehovah our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among them that call upon his name. They called upon Jehovah, and he answered them. He spake unto them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them. Wait, so Samuel was among those who called on the name of Jehovah. Abraham called on the name of Jehovah, the everlasting God. Really? Psalm 116, verse 2, verse 4, verse 13, and verse 17. Here, let's do this again. Psalm 116, okay, verse 2, verse 4, verse 13, and verse 17. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call on him as long as I live. Then called I upon the name of Jehovah. O Jehovah, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Right? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of Jehovah. Verse 17. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of Jehovah. Wait. Everyone help me understand. Already by 55 AD, thousands of Gentiles given up their worship of gods and goddesses. Thousands of Jews, monotheistic Jews. They're all united and characterized and known for this practice, calling on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. What is going on? Hey, you Greek, that Jesus you're calling upon lived less than 20 years ago, and he was killed like a criminal, buried less than 20 years ago. You know this. How could you give up Zeus and call on the name of this Jew? What are you doing? Hey, you Jew. You're a monotheist. You know the Old Testament. You're to call on the name of Jehovah alone. What are you doing calling on the name of this Jesus, a Jew, who was killed and buried less than 20 years ago? What are you guys doing? How do you account for this? How do you explain this? Do you see the depth, the clarity? the irrefutable witness to the triunity of God and that Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh? And yet you have people who say the Trinity is not biblical. Jesus isn't God. He's an agent of God. And they read these passages and they see them. It's not they don't see them, but they pervert them, misinterpret them, twist them to their shame and destruction. Right now, going back to First Corinthians eight six, let's go out with a bang, bada bing, bada boom. First Corinthians eight six. I believe in Ezekiel one. Justin, that was Jesus Christ in his preeminent existence, appearing as the glory of Jehovah God, a visible man, in visible glory on a visible throne, and I believe that was Jesus Christ in his preeminent existence. That he is the glory of the Father. He is the glory of Jehovah manifested. That's what I believe. Right? Okay. First Corinthians 8, 6. Now let's have fun. But to us there is but one God the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Only hardened anti-Trinitarian skeptics or critical liberal scholars will deny what I'm about to tell you. Get any good commentary, even by liberal scholars, even by a a Bart Ehrman, and they'll tell you this is what's known as the Christianizing, the Christianizing or the Christianization of the Shema. This is the Christian version of the Shema. What's the Shema? S-H-E-M-A. That's the Hebrew word for here. We use it in Assyrian. Shmir. As in Assyrian, I say Shmir. That means here. Shema is Hebrew for here. This is the Christianization, the Christianizing of the Shema. 
What's the Shema? In Hebrew, it's Shema Yisrael, Yahovah Eloheinu, Yahovah Echad. Deuteronomy 6.4. Here, O Israel, Jehovah our God is one Jehovah. Now you put Adonai. The Hebrew doesn't have Adonai. It's Yahovah. Yahovah. Yod, He, Vav, He. Shema Yisrael, Yahovah, Elohinu, Yahovah, Echad. Now, the Greek renders it as, let me find it for you, back before I even go there. Here, let me get the Greek. And we have the Greek version of it in Mark 12, 29. We have the Greek version of it, and I'm going to give you the Erasmian butchering of the Greek as I butcher the Erasmian butchering. Mark 12, 29. Here's how a Greek speaker pronounced Deuteronomy 6, 4. Here you go. Okay. Click on it. Here's how a Greek speaker would pronounce Deuteronomy 6, 4 in Greek. Okay. Apikrithe. Apikrithe. Ha Jesus hati prote estin. Now, aku akue akue. Now again, I'm butchering the Greek. I'm pronouncing it as an Erasmian would butcher it. Pay attention. Akue Israel. Akue is the Greek word for Shema. Akue Israel. Kurius Otheus Himun Kurius is estin. Kurius Otheus Himun Kurius is estin. Do you hear what I said? I gave you the link. Thank you for posting it. Catch it? Now, if you want the way an American would say it, Akwe, Israel. Kurios, Atheos, Hemon, Kurios, Ice, Estin. Okay, you guys got it? Thank you for posting it. Okay, now, did you see how Yahovah Echad was rendered? Yahovah Echad in Greek. Yahovah Echad in, it was rendered this way. Now read with me here. Kurias Is or Ice. Kurias Is. Estin, Esti, okay. Kurias Is. Now notice the Greek equivalent of Yahovah Echad, Yahovah is one, is Kurias Is. Kirius Is. Kurias Ice. Do you guys see it? It's there in the Greek. If you can't read the Greek, the translation of the Greek is Kurios, Otheos, Hemon, Kurios, Ice, Estine. Okay, you with me there? So, how would a Greek speaking Jew, how would a Greek speaking Jew utter the Shema in Greek? During the time of Christ, the Jews, out of reverence for God, would substitute Yahovah with Adonai. So they wouldn't say Shema Yisrael, Yahovah Eloheinu, Yahovah Echad. They would say Yahovah, I'm sorry, Shema Yisrael, Adonai. They would substitute Yah Yahovah with the word Adonai. Adonai is the Hebrew for Lord. The Greek equivalent, follow with me. The way you say Adonai in Greek is Kurios or Kurios. Kurios. You with me there? Are you with me there? Everyone with me there? The Jews at the time of Christ, out of reverence for the divine name, would say Adonai, not Yehovah. Adonai in Greek would be Kurios. Kurios. So the way a Greek speaking Jew would say Yehovah Echad, if he's speaking in Greek, Yahovah, it's Kyrios, Kyrios, Is, or Ice. Kyrios, Is, Kyrios, Is. Kyrios, Is is the Greek way of saying Yahovah Echad. Because Yahovah Echad would be pronounced Adonai Echad, Lord is one, which in Greek is Kyrios, Is, Kyrios, Is, Kyrios, Ice. You got it? Is it sinking in? Before I move on, is it sinking in? Okay. That means if I was living at the time of Paul and I said to Paul or another Jew, Kyrios is, they'd say, Hallelujah, Amin. Because to them, I just said Jehovah's one. 
So for a Greek-speaking Jew who doesn't worship gods and goddesses and lords, to say to a Jew in Greek, Kyrios is, is Kyrios, is Kyrios, Kyrios is, any form of that combination, they would take it to mean Jehovah is one. Are you getting this point? I'm going very slow. I'm going very slow. Because here's the nightmare for these anti-Trinitarian heretics, agents of Satan. Because when we look at 1 Corinthians 8 in the Greek, guess what Paul did? Only a hardened anti-Trinitarian denies this. Okay, here's the Greek. Oops, sorry. 1 Corinthians. What happened here? Oh, sorry. Hold on. Here you go. Here's the Greek. Thank God for modern technology. Here you go. Thank God for modern technology. Now, let me read to you the Greek. Tell me if it sounds... Remember, Kyrios is, Kyrios is, Lord is one, is Kyrios, is Kyrios. Tell me if you're catching it when I read the Greek for you, okay? El, I mean, now this is heis. There's, yeah, that's the thing about Greek. There's two words spelled similarly, is, heis, okay, heis. El Amin, I'll say it as Heis, so I don't confuse you. El Himin, Himin, El Himin, Heis, Theus, or Theos, Hapatev. Heis is the word for one, right? Also pronounced Is. I'm sorry, I don't want to confuse you. Okay. The Rasmian, okay, this is where I confuse you. Okay. The way English speakers of the Greek New Testament pronounce this word Is is Heis. Heis. A native Greek speaker pronounces it as is. This is where I just got discombobulated. I'm not going to pronounce it heis. Forget about heis. Okay, I'm going to pronounce it is. This is what happens when you get Americans and Europeans who don't know Greek try to pronounce Greek. They butcher it. Heis. No, it's is, right? A Greek speaker, and you have Greek speakers here. How would you say one in Greek? Would you say it is? Put a one if you say east, or would you say it heis? East, put one. Would you say heis? Put two. See? East, thank you. Thank these American scholars and English scholars for pronouncing it heis and then confusing the heck of us, the heck out of all of us. Anyway, let's come back. Don't forget, anytime you hear the word east, kirius, which in the English, these Englishmen would say, heis kurios. Or anytime you hear the word kurios, kurios, is, or kurios, heis, that's the Greek way of saying Jehovah's one, okay? Now, I'm going to read it. Tell me if you caught it, okay? El himin is theus or theos apater. El himin is theus or theos apater. One God, the Father. Ek hu tapanta. Ki hemes. Ais auton. I have to pronounce that differently. Okay. Ais auton. Now, tell me if this sounds familiar. Ki is curious. Is curious. Does that sound familiar? Is curious. Is curious. Does that sound familiar? I know I sound like a nut. Keep re repeating, right? Okay, now let me let me let me repeat it again if you got it. Let me repeat it again. Is Kyrios Jesus Christus. Bam. You see what he just did? Heis Kurios Jesus Christos. You see what he just did? He took the word is Kyrios and then filled it out with Jesus Christ. Paul just took the phrase is Kyrios or Heis Kurios which is the Greek way of saying Yahovah Echad, and then identify that is Kyrios as Jesus Christ. Do you see what he just did? You understand what he just did to a Greek-speaking Jew who knows the Shema? He just said to a Greek-speaking Jew, is Kyrios, Amen, Jesus Christus. What? So for a Greek-speaking Jew, Paul just said, is Kyrios, Amen. Shema. Jesus Christus. 
What? What did you just say? I know the East Kyrgyz. That's the Greek way of saying Yahovah Echad. That we know. But what did you just say after that? Is Kyrgyz. Jesus Christus. Listen, Christians. There's one Jehovah, and his name is Jesus Christ. That's what he just did. That's what he just did with the Greek. There is no honest way of getting around this. There is no honest way of getting... If you're honest to Scripture and you fear God and let God be God, Paul just told you the Father is God and Jesus is Jehovah. He used two different divine titles to identify two different persons as God. He's saying, Israel, Jehovah our God, Jehovah's one. You know who that is? It's the Father and Son. The Father is our God and Jesus is Jehovah. This is why it's called the Christianizing, the Christianization of the Shema. You understand what he just did? Is it sinking in? Folks, remember what I said earlier. Paul wrote this in passing in 55 AD. He doesn't have to explain it. He doesn't have to defend it. He doesn't have to articulate what he means. Because he's writing to people who already believe this, already assume this, already take this for granted. That means they came to this conviction long before 55 AD. So you, now you have a group of Gentiles and Jews long before 55 AD already worshiping Jesus as the Jehovah of Deuteronomy 6.4. Already worshiping Jesus as the Jehovah of Deuteronomy 6.4. I'm going to ask you guys a question. What in the world would lead monotheistic Jews and Greeks to worship a crucified Jew who had lived less than 20 years from the time of this writing, whom they knew was a historical figure who was beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, spiked to a cross, died? What would lead all of these people to come to the conviction that crucified Jew, beaten, bloodied, Put to death and buried. He is the one Jehovah of the Old Testament. The Shema is Deuteronomy 6, 4. Chapter 6, verse 4, Justin. It's here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In Greek, the Lord is one is Kyrios Is Estin. Now, the way they pronounce it in the seminaries is Kurios Heis Estin. So, Justin H., for a Greek-speaking Jew... Greek-speaking Jew. If you say to a Greek-speaking Jew, Is Kyrios, they know what you're saying. Yeah. Yahovah Chad. Shema, yeah. But then when you come out and say, Is Kyrios, Kyrios, Isus Christus, you just said to that Jew, that one Jehovah is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Is this Bible amazing? And do you have any doubt it's truly the Word of God and the God of the Bible is truly alive? He is real and Jesus is truly risen. He is alive. He will come again. And because He lives, He lives in us and He loves us more than we can imagine. And ain't you thankful, I should say, aren't you, to be grammatically correct, that Jehovah Jesus, Jehovah Jesus, because He's alive, He's real. Every generation, he raises up men and women after his heart, empowered by the Spirit, to reveal himself through them to you. So you have no doubt, God is real, Jesus is alive, and if you believe in him, death is not the end of you, it's the beginning, because you're going to live forever with him. But remember, he raises up imperfect vessels with issues, like me, like our brother James White, whom I love, I love him, pray God preserve him, like David Wood, Chris, you name it. In fact, what I'm going to recommend before I end it, I'm going to give you two links to two debates James White had. One with a Muslim named Jalal Abu Arum and one with a Unitarian heretic named Patrick Navis. And he schooled them and used these very arguments to prove Jesus is Jehovah God, distinct from the Father and the Spirit, and one with them in essence. Right? 
Now, let me put the icing on the cake and give you further proof, further proof that Paul just identified Jesus as Jehovah God. You, can I give you further proof? Further proof from 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. And this is what I, I want you to test this argument. Folks, we're giving you, I'm giving you, James White's giving you, David Wood is giving you, Volcat Malone's giving you, Osama Dakduk is giving you. Battle-tested arguments. Arguments we've used in the battlefield, the spiritual battlefield, that work by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're giving you actual arguments to demolish every objection, destroy every stronghold, to take hearts captive for Jesus. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to use this argument in the way I'm going to articulate it. Are you ready? Are you ready? How to use this argument? Don't know, need to know Greek. None of it. Okay. First Corinthians 8, verse 6. I want you to use it with a Jehovah Witness this week. Pray they come to your door or go to their kingdom hall. Get so excited, go to their kingdom hall. Okay. First Corinthians 8, verse 6. Okay. Let's look at it one more time. Aren't you excited? Aren't you happy and blessed that the triune God is in love with you, in love with us? God is real and he's in love with us. And because of him, we're in love with him. Now, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. Okay, watch here. Watch here. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. Read. But to us there is but one God the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him. Now, you stop there. Stop there. You ask the question, set it up this way, say, can I ask you a question? When it says, of whom are all things, does this mean all creation? Get them to admit, all things means all creation. The entire creation, yes. So the entire creation came into existence by the will of God the Father? Are you listening to me? Learn how to use this argument. You say, okay, all things, does that mean all creation? They'll say yes, all creation. The entire creation, right? Yes. So all creation came into being by the will of God the Father, right? Yes. They'll say yes, right? You with me there? Who's going to say no? They're going to say yes, right? You, you got it? So if I ask you, Christians, when it says, of whom God the Father, all things came into being. It means all creation came into existence because of the God the Father, right? You'll say yes. So then now you got a problem because let's read the second part. Now let's read the second part. Now you got a problem, Jehovah Witness, anti-Trinitarian, Unitarian, son of Satan, daughter of Satan. Here's the problem, 1611, going to heaven. Watch here. Now let's read it again. All of whom are all things, but then now notice the second part. When we wait for 1 Corinthians 8, 6 before. Now notice, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. End of story. You just told me, Joe Witness, all things means all creation. All things means the entire creation. So God the Father brought the entire creation into being by Jesus Christ. How can Jesus be part of creation when he's the one who was there with the Father before all creation, and the Father used him to bring all creation into existence? You just proved that Jesus is separate from all creation and therefore is uncreated by nature. No wonder he's the one Jehovah. Now let's see how the Jehovah Witness Bible renders it because Billy Mandalay was asking me if the New World Translation renders it the same way. Sila, keep to the point, not the word. Here's the New World Translation. There is actually to us one God the Father, from whom are all things, from whom all things are, and we for him. And there is one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things are, and we through him. Did you catch it? That's the Jehovah's Witness translation. Read it again, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. Notice their translation. There is actually to us one God the Father, from whom, from whom all things are, and we for him. We exist for God. And there is one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things are, and we through him. And we exist because Jesus sustains us. So you ask the Jehovah's Witness, just let him read the first part, when it says, from whom all things are, is that all creation? Is it referring to the entire creation coming, coming into being because of God the Father? They have to say yes. Say, now you just destroyed your religion. Because the second part says, 
that those things, all things which you just admit is all creation, came into being through the Son, the one Lord who was there with the Father. Which means that the Son is separate from all things, which you just admit means all creation. So he's uncreated by nature, one with the Father in essence. No wonder he's the one Jehovah. So is there any doubt that what Paul has done, he has Christianized the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4, identifying two divine persons as the one Jehovah God of Israel. God is the Father, the one Jehovah is Jesus. Two different titles to distinguish two different persons, divine persons, who are essentially one in their essence. The Father is the one God and Jesus is the one Jehovah. Distinct persons who are the one God, Jehovah, who brought all creation into being. Is there any way around this? One of my favorite passages of Scripture. Favorite passage of Scripture. Proving that Jesus is Jehovah in the flesh. Proving he's a different person from the Father. Proving though they're different divine persons, two divine persons, they are still the one God of Israel. Because Jehovah God is one. But that one Jehovah God is now identified as the Father and the Son. So you understand what he did? He took that phrase, our God, hero Israel, Jehovah, our God, Jehovah's one. And he says that phrase, God, that's the Father. And that one Jehovah is Jesus. So he's not using two titles implying lesser degrees of divinity. He's not saying one Lord has a lesser meaning than the one God. Because to be the one Lord means you're the one Jehovah. And Jehovah is God Almighty, but if you're the one God, you have to be Jehovah because there is no other God besides Jehovah. You see what he did? You see the brilliance of Paul? Do you see the proof that the Holy Spirit is filling him with wisdom and knowledge and understanding? Because if you're the one God, you have to be Jehovah because Jehovah is the one God. But if you're the one Lord, that makes you Jehovah. And if you're the one Lord, you're also the one God. You get what he's doing? Who's the one God? Jehovah who's the one Jehovah the one God but wait you just said the one God is the father yes and you said the one Jehovah is Jesus yes because the father being the one God is Jehovah and Jesus being the one Jehovah is the one God but not the same person as the father clear Did it sink in? Someone asked me about Hebrews 7, 3. Let me do one thing real quick. Because I got to take a real, well, I don't know. Can I do it, finish it? I don't know. Who asked me about Hebrews 1, 3? Are they still here? Hebrews 7, 3. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3. Someone here? I'm going to have to do something real quick. Hope you don't mind. And then I'm going to have to, if he's not here, then I'll do it tomorrow. Because we're already 117 minutes. I guess not. All right. Well, look, okay, if he's not here, then we'll just pick it up tomorrow. You got, oh, by the way, side note, another thing why I love the King James Version. I don't have time to unpack this, and it's not a big deal. But up until the rise of modern versions, when the King James Bible was the chief translation for English-speaking Christians, basically everyone read the same Bible and read it the same way, meaning they would quote a verse and read the same way. What you find now is translations attempting to be, quote-unquote, more literal to the Greek and the prepositions used so that it's so subtle you didn't catch it. Let's compare, and the New World Translation follows that spirit, right? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6 one more time with the King James and the New World Translation back-to-back. -back. I have an article on this. I'll send it. I'll put it in the description box, and I'll put... The links to James, James White's debates in the description box, and I'll post it right now before I end it. But before I do that, I want you to catch something. It's very subtle. You got to really pay attention. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, in the King James, the New World Translation. Up until the rise of modern translations, when the King James was a chief English translation for English-speaking Christians, we all read the Bible in the same way, meaning it read the same way, and we would quote it the same way. But now modern versions are trying to be more literal to the Greek, so they say. 
But now watch. You're not going to catch it if you don't read carefully. There is actually to us one God the Father from whom all things are, and we for him. And there is one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things are, and we through him. Through. Now watch the King James. But to us there is but one God the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ by whom are all things, and we by him. Do you see how they translate the preposition differently? The pre preposition D, dia, D. Did you catch it? Jehovah Witness rendered as through, King James as by. Now you may think that's not a subtle difference. It is. Because of translating the preposition D or dia as through, Jehovah's Witnesses argue that Jesus didn't create anything. Creation wasn't made by him. He was a passive instrument. Someone else made it through him. So the Father created all things. Creation came into being by the Father using Jesus as a passive instrument. But when you render the preposition as by, you can't use that argument. It's by him. You see the subtle difference? You see how even the rendering of a preposition can be used of the children of the devil to demote and dishonor Christ as the creator of all things. Did you catch how subtle it was? Take care, medic. I'm almost done, but you can listen to the rest of it tomorrow. Let me give you a few more examples. Again, John chapter 1, verse 3. In the New World Translation, Jehovah's Witness and the King James. I don't know what you mean, the resurrection. What resurrection? John 1, 3, King James, New World Translation. Thank the admins and thank Protestant for serving us, helping me to help you. Notice the New World Translation. All things came into existence through him. And apart from him, not even one thing came into existence. What has come into existence? Through him. Notice King James. Very well, Psalm 55. Notice King James. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. All things were made by him. See the difference again? John 1.10 in both versions. I'll give you two more examples. We're done. But that's their argument, Daily Gripe. And it's not only their argument, Daily Gripe. Other Unitarian heretics who are Arians but not Joe's Witnesses, like Patrick Navis, use that same argument that the preposition di, dia, refers to Christ as the instrumental agent, the instrument through whom the Father created, in order to diminish his honor and glory as the creator. Now, notice John 1.10 in both versions. And this is other translations, like NIV. Okay. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. King James. Where's the New World Translation? And the world knew him not. So the world was made by him. New World Translation. He was in the world, and the world came into existence through him. You see the subtlety? Through him? By him? See, if you say by him, you can't say he was a passive agent, a passive instrument. Right? He's an active agent of creation. Active. The creation is just as much his work as it is the Father's and the Spirit. Okay? Finally, we'll use two more. Colossians 1, 16, 17. Can you do me a favor? Protestant, don't use, don't use the neural translation here. Either use ESV or NIV. Exactly. Thanks to... Well, even though the prepositions are the same in the Greek manuscripts around here, but thanks to Westcott and Hort in introducing the revised version, right? Instead of saying faithful to their commission to update the King James, to modernize the King James and stay, stay with the same set of manuscripts, they introduced a completely different translation, the revised version. And it's gone downhill ever since around here. Now watch here. Now we're not going to use the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Either he's going to use ESV, NIV, but compare. Colossians 1, 16, 17. Poor guy works hard. We don't need 15. Colossians 1, 16 to 17. Guy works hard. What translation are you quoting, though? 
You didn't tell me. I know it's King James. What's the other one? ESV? Okay. Guys, pay attention to prepositions. ESV is a Trinitarian translation. We're almost done, King of Kings. A couple more minutes, I'm done. Notice this. ESV. For by him, that's good. They got that good. All things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Dia, D. You don't need to keep quote verse 15. I don't know what it is about 15. You really like it, Protestant, but don't like it too much. Now notice the King James. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or personalities, principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. ESV translated all things were created through him, D, the preposition D, D, yeah. King James, by him. You get it? Do you see the subtle difference? ESV is a Trinitarian translation. They love the Trinity and they believe Jesus is the active creator of all things. But still being influenced by scholarship, they rendered D or Dia as through him as opposed to by him. Right? Hebrews 1, verse 2. Hebrews 1, verse 2. Heiser is good, Sila. He's excellent, but he's not perfect, and he has a lot of mistakes and errors. I've written some articles refuting some of his assertions, and I did some talks, and I'll continue to do so, because he has a strong influence, and there are people who swear by him whom I call Heiserites, even though that's not his fault. Hebrews 1, 2, guys. Pay attention. ESV, pay attention. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Through whom, notice King James, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Which is more powerful to say everything was created by Jesus or through Jesus? What's more powerful, folks? Ain't you glad, I should say aren't you, because i got to be scholarly, that the King James Bible was produced, an amazing God-honoring translation that the Lord was pleased to have translated by 54 scholars of the highest eminence and to make it the cheap translation for English-speaking churches for over 300 years where we all read the same translation and read the passage the same way. Right? Finally, this one has to do with textual criticism, variant readings in the manuscripts. God bless you, Psalm 55. Subscribe to my page, watch my talks, pass them on to my Assyrian community, and also read my articles. Spread this to my Assyrian brother, sister, Psalm. Contact me on my social media. We'll talk, especially if you're in the USA. Final one. This one's really going to shock you. This one's really going to shock you. This has to do with textual criticism, the manuscripts and variant readings. Ephesians 3, 9, ESV, and King James. And that's going to now put you on a journey on doing more in-depth study on translations and variant readings. And I'm going to just leave you with a note of caution. Ephesians 3, 9. ESV, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. And, and, end of verse. King James, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world had been in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. <whistles> that last phrase, by Jesus Christ, is not found in modern versions because the Greek manuscripts that they prioritize doesn't have that last clause. You caught it? Now, with that said, I don't want you to go in panic mode. Psalm 55. Are you on Facebook? Look for Sam Shimon Ben Malik. And here, save my email here. Hold on. Okay, I don't want you to go in panic mode. Let me just be honest and to the point. All the major English translations done by evangelical scholars 
will basically, over 90% of the time, pay attention, over 90% of the time, some have said about 93 to 98% of the time, read the same way and give you the same theology, Christology, pneumatology. In other words, you're not going to get a different Jesus, a different God, a different spirit. Okay? Because the bulk of our manuscripts, we have over 25,000 manuscripts in different languages, about 5,900 Greek. Even these manuscripts, if you compare them, agree over 90% of the time. So if I have a copy of John in the second century, it's not to give me a different theology of a copy of John in the ninth century. I'm going to get the same theology, the same Jesus, the same salvation. But here's the issue. Do you just want the message or do you want to come as close as possible to every single syllable word that the authors wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit? See, that's the debate. You want the same message? Or do you want to cut back to every wording of the originals? Because we all camps agree, all camps agree, pay attention, that all the original wording of the autographs have been preserved by God in the extent manuscripts. But not all camps agree that we can know with 100% absolute certainty what every original word of the original autographs happen to be. They'll tell you, that in the variants, if you have two or three variants, one of those variants have the original wording. But we cannot know with absolute certainty which of those variants happen to be the original in every single instance. That's the position of the majority of New Testament textual critics who are evangelicals. And that's the position of those Christians translating your modern Bibles. Now, there is one camp that says not only has God preserved all the original wording, but he's actually given us access to the original wordings of the original autographs when he guided the church to collate those manuscripts that came out of the majority text called the Byzantine text, right? Which then produced the King James Bible, which didn't simply prioritize the received text, but also looked at other versions like the Latin Vulgate. So for the English-speaking Christians, every original wording that God originally inspired in the original writings, in the autographs, he's now given access to those original wording in the King James. That's what the other camp says. So those are the two camps. These are the two different positions, the two different beliefs. You pray and ask the Spirit to guide you which camp you want to fall under or belong to or neither camp. That's between you and the Holy Spirit, right? Clear? 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 Because I'm going to end it now. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah. Yehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we love you. Forgive us. Forgive me for any error. Convict me not to repeat those errors and save them from any errors, Father. Strengthen us. Strengthen us by the power of the Holy Spirit and the truth that I proclaim. To live your word perfectly and love you perfectly and even die for you if necessary, Father. If necessary, Lord Jesus, if necessary, Spirit. Lord Jesus, cover us by your blood. Cover my daughters by your precious blood. And surround us with a wall of fire from your glorious Holy Spirit. Save us from the world, from Satan, from these trials, from our flesh. And provide for us until it's time for us to leave or you return, Lord Jesus. And keep us more in love with you every day. And please help us not to be hypocrites, disqualifying ourselves from your grace and love. We love you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, please show up for me November 20th. Keep me here that I don't have to go back and bring my daughters to me and use me to bless your people always, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. You are the Son of God. You are risen. You are alive. You are Lord. You will come again physically. And we eagerly await your coming. Maranatha. In Jesus' name, amen. Vine, you asked me a question about the Vulgate. Interestingly, the Latin is much closer to the received text, that stream of Greek manuscripts from which we get the King James. Did you know that? Let me see where your quote is, right? I can't find it. Where did you? Where is it? Guys, keep praying and fasting for me that I don't get summoned to Chicago. Stay here. That she realizes I live here now. I'm not coming back. And God removed this debt, forty thousand. May the Lord rebuke that debt. It's not mine. And preserve the money He's given me for my children for His glory. Okay, Vine, where's your comment? I don't see it. Can you make your comment again about the Vulgate so I can go? I can't find it.
Oh, Latin Vol Volga could potentially use the same argument? Yeah, well, v Vine, I actually agree with you. The Latin Vulgate was the version that God was pleased for Latin-speaking Christians. That's my point. Since the Latin Vulgate became the dominant version for Latin-speaking Christians, that means God must have been pleased with that version for Latin speakers, as he's pleased with the Pshitta for Syriac speakers, as he was pleased with the ecclesiastical text, the Byzantine text for Greek speakers, from which we get the King James, because the King James translators, line didn't just slavishly follow the Greek. They also looked at the Latin and other versions. So, uh, Vine, that's making my argument. Whatever translation or version became the dominant translation for that particular group must have had God's amen and approval. Otherwise, we're going to have to assume that God allowed Latin-speaking Christians to follow a corrupt Latin version that God had nothing to do with. There goes God's providential preservation of his word and making sure his churches received a certain word from him. You get my point, Vine? Even with the differences among them, God was pleased. You get what I'm saying, Vine? Just want to make sure you got the argument. And interestingly, Vine, the Latin Vulgate is much closer to the received text. Right? It's much closer in its readings with the Byzantine text than it is with the earlier papyri. And interestingly, Vine, do you know what which version preserved 1 John 5, 7? There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. It was the Latin stream. The Latin stream preserved that wording. Even there's a note that many say it's not from Jerome. And I believe, don't quote me on this, going by memory, from the 6th century, a note that we have, still extent. Some say it's not from Jerome, but others say, no, it is from Jerome, where Jerome admitted vine. Jerome admitted, if it is from Jerome, and I have no doubt, I have no reason to doubt it is. Some say, no, someone else wrote it. Where Jerome says that 1 John 5, 7 was in the accurate copies of the Greek, but some unscrupulous people were omitting 1 John 5, 7. So it's interesting that 1 John 5, 7, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. These are one was actually testified to and preserved in the Latin stream by Latin-speaking Christians. Wow. So you King James only folks, don't be so harsh and cruel against the Latin Vulgate or the Latin stream. Because we have a Latin father, Cyprian, writing in Latin that mentions 1 John 5, 7, and he's a third century witness to it. And other Latin-speaking Christians mention it as inspired and as part of the epistle of John. And there's a note attributed to Jerome saying it is in the most accurate copies. So King James only? What's your beef with the Latin Vulgate? Even the King James translators appeal to the Latin. What's wrong with you guys? Celebrate. And it's those who prioritize the Greek. Did you know that, King James only, folks? It's those who prioritize the Greek that use that as an argument against 1 John 5.7. Yes, it's not found in the oldest Greek copies we have. It comes from the Latin trans uh, stream. And on that grounds, they reject it. Come on now. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Take care. Keep praying for my miracle. Next Wednesday, I need a miracle or I'm a goner. Let's trust in a miracle, amen? So I can be around to bless you for the sake of the Lord. Take care.